What do I do if I dig up a frog while I'm gardening? Some Australian frogs burrow into the ground during the dry season and wait for the rains to come. If you dig up a burrowing frog that's asleep, what you need to do is put it back where it was, bury it over and leave it there. It'll wake up again when the rains come. Are all ladybird beetles good for the garden? Well, yes, they mostly are. There's over 100 species in Australia and they do fantastic things. There's a species that eats fungus off your cucurbits. Other species will eat pest insects. There are a couple of villains that will eat the leaves on your plants and there's heaps of resources online to help identify them. But really, who doesn't love the beetles? What's a way to keep the lawn down without having to fire up the mower? Well, I'm trying rabbits. These little cuties are mini lops, which make great pets for the kids. And their hutch is connected to a movable pen by a flexible plastic tube, which acts a bit like a tunnel. And the rabbits come out in the morning and at dusk to feed over the lawn, chewing it to keep it down. I can move the pen around so the rabbits get fresh grass and also so they don't wear areas out. And it gets mown down nice and evenly. It's a win-win. And as an added bonus, their urine-soaked straw in the hutch is great for my compost. Where do honeybees go in winter? Well, basically, they stay inside their hive and huddle together to keep warm. And they'll only go out to forage from flowers with nectar when it's a bright, sunny day and the temperature is warm enough. What does sugar bag taste like? Well, forget ordinary honey. This is totally different. It's a complex flavour, it's quite runny, and it has a distinctive tang of citrus. You don't get much from a hive. These little bees work really hard, but only in a good year will I get some honey from them, and maybe about one litre from a hive like this. So it's not very productive. But having them in the garden is an absolute joy. I love watching them work. And the honey, really, well, that is just the cherry on top of all the pollination work they do for me and my food garden. I love to grow tomatoes. But there's one pest problem that I usually get most years. And I have to deal with it. It doesn't show up till we have significant hot, dry weather, usually the first heat wave. And it's called tomato russet mite. These tiny microscopic sap-sucking insects can't be seen by the naked eye, but you can certainly see the damage they do. What you'll start to notice is the foliage of the plant is affected from the bottom up. Initially, the leaves go silvery, and then they end up going brown like this. And basically, it works its way up the plant. Now, when I see this, the first thing I do is try and pick off any affected leaves. Then I look at treating the plant with a seaweed-based plant tonic feeding it and making sure that it's watered well. Now, mites only affect plants when we have dry heat. So if the temperature is over 35 degrees, I cover this area with shade cloth. And if I need to treat, I can spray with either a horticultural oil, with an insecticidal soap spray or wettable sulphur. The reason that you need to treat it is if it gets really bad and if all the foliage dies off like this, you'll find that any fruit left on the plant is exposed to the sun and it will get sunburnt. It's a little known fact that garden gnomes are a bringer of good luck. A quirky garden ornament, usually depicted as male, wearing a pointy hat and a big beard. Whoa. But where does this concept come from? Well, in ancient Roman times, the rich Romans would put mythical figurines in their gardens, most likely as an omen for fertility and prosperity. Jump forward to late 1700s Europe, where gnome-like figurines became very popular decorations, and Germany in particular embraced the gnome. Figurines were conflated with traditional stories about elves and fairies and the little folk that they believed helped around the mines and on farms. The popularity of garden gnomes continued to spread throughout Europe and down under. Australians were stocking up on gnomes in the 1950s and 60s as ornaments to brighten up the yard. The cool thing is, they don't need any water, they need very little maintenance. And besides, who doesn't need a little bit of good luck and a bit of cheer in the garden? What can I do about spider mite? 
Spider mites are tiny, sap-sucking pests, and so often their initial damage goes unnoticed, but when it gets really bad, then it becomes obvious. Now, they feed on the underside of leaves, and you can see here the tiny, peppery little marks that they make eventually coalesce, and they form brown patches, which, when you walk past the plant, are really obvious. By this stage, the infestation is well advanced. So the first thing you can do is to remove the source of infection and get rid of the mites and the eggs on these leaves. But generally speaking, mites are at their worst when the humidity is low and the temperatures are high. So certain climate zones find a regular infestation with mites a fact of life, whereas in places like Brisbane, where we have high humidity in summer, the humidity acts as breaks the humidity actually stops a lot of the eggs of spider mites from hatching. So there's the next step. Prevention of mites can involve boosting the humidity around the plants, using water to mist the undersides of the leaves where the mites feed and lay their eggs. In a glass house or an igloo, you can water the ground with moisture regularly and boost the humidity. The ideal quick fix is this. It's wettable sulphur. It's an organic remedy as old as the hills. It worked for my grandfather and it works for me. You make sure you follow the instructions on the pack and apply this two or three times and you can clean up any infestation of mites at any time of the year. Did you know that in Australia we've got over 1,000 species of earthworm and that globally there are over 7,000 species? It's estimated there are 300 individual earthworms for every square metre of soil on Earth. They've even been ranked the number one most influential species in the history of the planet. Worms are vitally important for soil ecology in our farms, in the bush and in our gardens. But have you ever wondered how worms can find a mate, how they can avoid predators, or how they even know which direction to travel in? Well, researchers have found that they can communicate with each other using touch and taste. They can feel vibrations in the soil so they can avoid predators. And there's even evidence to suggest that they like to travel in herds and follow a leader. Now that would make for one serious wormhole.